my grandson. He's one year old. And that's his great grandfather. He's 87 years old. I barely knew my grandparents. But many children born today will know their great grandparents. When my grandson was born, the world had very few countries where more than 20% of the population was over 65 years of age. But when my grandson is 40, he'll be living in a world the likes of which we have never seen. The fastest growing demographic group in the United States today consists of octogenarians and above. When I was born, there were about 1.5 million of them. When my grandson was born, there are 11 million of them. And by 2050, when my grandson is 40, there will be 32 million. The number will have tripled from what it is today. And like everything else, this has its good points and its bad points. And the bad point is that when you hit age 65, your risk for Alzheimer's disease begins to rise exponentially. 63, you were wondering how old I am. Now, let's do an experiment. Would all of you who will be 80 years or older by 2050, please raise your hand, assuming you make it that far. Uh, great, okay. The good news is if you make it that far, you know, that's wonderful. The bad news is one out of every two of you who raised your hands will have Alzheimer's disease, unless we do something about it. On this picture, there are two people who have Alzheimer's disease. Can you identify them? He's one, he's 82. And she's the other, she's 59. Alzheimer's disease is a disease of aging, but it is not exclusively a disease of the aged. Right now there are 250,000 people with Alzheimer's disease who are less than 65 years of age. And by 2050, there'll be a million of them. There'll be 15 million total Alzheimer's patients in the United States and 100 million in the world by 2050. And if we extrapolate those numbers out to the end of the century, then by 2100, there will be 300 million Alzheimer's patients worldwide. That's about the population of the United States today. Unless, of course, we do something about it. Now, if you knew that an asteroid was going to hit the Earth and would kill 100 million people, you would probably expect a worldwide clamor that something be done about it. Well, in 2050, 100 million people will have Alzheimer's disease. It's a fatal disease. They'll die from it. And yet, I hear no clamor. I see no sense of urgency. I do not feel the kind of sense of imminent threat that the numbers I've just given you suggest ought to be there. And this passivity, I think, has some curious origins. And I want to talk about those in a minute. But before I do, let me simply talk a little bit about the science of Alzheimer's. Because this passivity comes at a very unfortunate time. It comes at a time when we've really begun to understand the origins of the disease and the way in which it develops. Alzheimer's disease is caused by the dying of nerve cells, neurons, in the brain. And they die in such numbers that the brain gets smaller and develops holes where it used to have healthy tissue. If you drill down to look at the individual neurons, they're shrunken. They don't have as many spines and dendrites. And around them, you see plaques, dense aggregates of misfolded protein molecules. And inside the neurons, you see additional misfolded protein molecules in the form of what are called tangles. The plaques precede the tangles. The tangles may be the way in which the plaques cause the dying of the neurons. 
misfolded proteins. I'm telling you this because this is the key to the disease in many respects. Proteins, in order to function properly, have to fold up like an origami bird. But the folding process is not perfect, and occasionally they will misfold. And when they misfold, this is bad. But the cell contains quality control machinery that can identify misfolded proteins, and when it does identify misfolded proteins, it can get rid of them. That machinery, however, is also not perfect. And sometimes it fails, and when it fails over a period of time, the misfolded proteins build up and aggregate. And sometimes within those aggregates, during the process of aggregation, a different folded form of the protein occurs that is dangerous, toxic, fatal to the cell. That's what happens in Alzheimer's disease. The plaques consist of misfolded proteins, and that protein molecule that misfolds can give rise to toxic species that's fatal to the neuron. There are about as many neurons in the human brain as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. But they're not just randomly arranged in jumbles. They form networks of connected neurons. There's a network that's responsible for the formation of new memories, for example. And Alzheimer's disease is focal. It starts at a particular point in the brain and then spreads along those networks until eventually large portions of the brain are affected. This is something new. We didn't understand that completely until very recently. And it's very important because what's spreading from cell to cell, from a dying cell to a healthy neighboring cell, is the toxic species. And while it's spreading, the toxic species is vulnerable. It's outside the cell. It means we might be able to kill it, or we might be able to figure out how to block the spread and confine the disease to a small number of foci. So this is a recent discovery that's very exciting for the development of potential therapies. I want to tell you about one other exciting recent discovery. I'm even more excited about that because it comes from my own lab and the laboratories of my collaborators at Columbia University and Brandeis University. And that has to do with how the toxic species is formed. The plaques consist of a protein called A-beta. But A-beta is actually a piece of a larger protein called APP. It's a fragment. And that fragment is produced by two molecular scissors, enzymes, that cut the fragment out of APP and give rise to this A-beta protein that aggregates and misfolds. The scissors are digestive enzymes, much like the enzymes in your stomach that digest proteins, but instead what they do is they're chopping up proteins in the brain. And this process is bad. But it doesn't happen very often in a healthy brain. In an Alzheimer's brain, it happens far more often than it should. And the revolutionary new information is about why that happens. So every cell contains a pathway, a process, that deals with recycling proteins. If you have bottles that you want to recycle, you bag them up, they go to the garbage truck, and the garbage truck might take them to the recycling bin, and then you can reuse them. But the garbage truck could also decide to take them to the dump, and if the dump eventually fills up too much, you may build up toxic waste. Well, if what you want to recycle is APP, which has that A-beta fragment built into it, the garbage bags are things called vesicles inside the cell. The recycling bin happens to be a structure in the cell called the Golgi, and if APP goes through that pathway, it gets back to the cell surface and it's fine. But every once in a while, the garbage truck decides to take it to the trash bin, which is an organelle called the lysosome. And when APP finds itself there, you have a problem because that's where the scissors are. And that's where you cut out A beta and you begin to build up the toxic species. Most of the time, the truck goes in the recycling direction. But in Alzheimer's patients, there's a problem. The truck which is another organelle called the, the endosome, isn't directed to the proper place all the time. There's a truck driver, a complex of proteins called retromer, and retromer takes the, the truck and its contents where it should go. But in Alzheimer's patients, retromer is defective, and you spend too much time going to the pathway on the right, and when that happens, you build up the toxic species. 
what we've done is to develop a set of drugs that interact with the truck driver, with Retromer, and direct traffic back to the recycling bin. They work great in cell culture of neurons. We don't yet know how they'll work in animals or people. The animal trials are starting as we speak. But this is an example of some of the exciting new developments in Alzheimer's research that could give rise to therapy. I could cite a number of others from other laboratories as well. So given what I've just told you, that this is a crisis that's coming, and given what I've just told you, that there's exciting new results that could lead to a therapy, you would think that resources are pouring into questions like this to deal with the disease and to try to treat the disease. And if you thought that, you'd be wrong. Federal spending on Alzheimer's research, even with President Obama's new initiative, is about $600 million a year. But that's about a quarter of what we spend on AIDS research. I'm not saying that we're spending too much money on AIDS. What I'm saying is we're spending not nearly enough on Alzheimer's research. One of the few things that throwing money at actually works is biomedical research. You throw more money at biomedical research and good people flock to the field and you get good research. We're not throwing enough money at Alzheimer's research and the consequence of that is that over the last 10 years, the death rates for AIDS and for many cancers and for heart disease have been going down, while the death rate for Alzheimer's disease has been going up. So that brings me to the question of why this passivity? Why, in the face of this oncoming tsunami of Alzheimer's, are we doing so little? I've thought about that a lot, and I think there are a number of reasons. One is that Alzheimer's disease has been considered, like many mental illnesses, something of a stigma. And Alzheimer's patients become invisible to us as a consequence. A second reason is that for a long time, people thought that becoming senile was inevitable, that this was just a part of getting older and there was nothing you could do about it. It's only relatively recently that we understand that Alzheimer's is a disease and that it can be cured. I told you that one out of every two of you will get Alzheimer's disease if you live into your mid-80s, but one out of every two of you won't. This is something we can treat, but that's something that people haven't fully appreciated. Now, AIDS got a tremendous boost of funding and enthusiasm in part because the AIDS patients did a great job of raising people's awareness of the disease. Alzheimer's patients can't do that. Alzheimer's patients are undergoing a progressive destruction of their ability to think and speak. Their personality begins to go. And the people who care for them, who you might think would be the logical people to drive the conversation forward, they can't do it either. Because they, you see, are the hidden victims of this Alzheimer's tsunami. Most Alzheimer's patients are cared for at home by family members, and there are 15 million such caregivers now. That's about three per Alzheimer's patient, which means that by the end of the century, when there are 300 million Alzheimer's patients, there will be a billion people in the world caring for them. And you can only imagine what that must be like. The emotional, financial, physical crippling that takes place for the caregivers as well as the Alzheimer's patients themselves. The cost of that is almost the same as the cost of the disease itself. And by the time the process has reached an end, the caregivers themselves are too worn out to be the kind of advocates that this disease might require. They are the face of the disease as much as the victims themselves. And so when I think about all this, I wonder a bunch of things. I wonder, will we make life better for the caregivers? Will we do the things we need to do in society? I don't know whether we can do that or not. I wonder whether resources will be available to really mobilize the research needed to treat and cure this disease. I wonder whether people will appreciate the oncoming tsunami. But most of all, I wonder about 
the five million Americans and 25 million people in the world who are living with this disease and the 100 million people who are caring for them now. And I wonder about the children who may be living in a world eventually where there are 300 million Alzheimer's patients and a billion people caring for them. They can't speak for themselves. Who will speak for them? And who will listen? Thank you.